After covering Denis Villeneuve's Dune Part 2 in multiple videos and hearing what others have had to say about the film, it's quite clear that the director has made a film that, like the first, respectfully honours the source material, especially when it comes to the central themes and purpose of Frank Herbert's novel. But having read the book and watching the film multiple times, there are a few big differences between them. So in this video, I'm going to be looking at the biggest differences between the Dune Part 2 movie and Frank Herbert's novel giving us a greater understanding of why Denis made these changes in his adaptation and giving you my own thoughts towards them. Before I get into it though, if you want to keep up to date on any of my future content for Dune Part 2, then don't forget to support this upload by giving it a like rating, subscribing to the channel, and turning on your notifications. But without further ado, let's dive into the biggest differences between Dune Part 2 and the book. So we all know that books are books and films are films, and changes must be made when transitioning between the two mediums to make a more streamlined and cinematic telling of a story on the big screen. There is an argument to be made that Dune can be told in full in other mediums like television, and while I won't deny that there is a case in that, I think there's also the case that Dune is part of a story that can work on a visceral and cinematic level. You feel connected in that way when you read it, and this was the dream of director Denis Villeneuve when he set out to adapt it. To bring the dream of Dune to life on the big screen and visually tell that story as best as he could. In my opinion, I think he made one of the most faithful recreations of Herbert's vision by honouring the core themes that Herbert wanted audiences to understand with his original novel. And the big one was the questioning of charismatic leaders, an idea that didn't fully get across at first, meaning that he wrote a second book in Dune Messiah to make his true intentions clear. And the reason I bring this up is because when it ultimately comes down to it, Denis made most of the changes he did to keep the film as streamlined as possible for all audiences, and so that the viewer could focus on that crucial critique of Messiahs. And again, with Dune being such a hard novel to adapt, I think as a whole, this is a great adaptation of that material. Maybe in Dune Messiah, we'll see some of the things that weren't in part two adapted in a big way. Choice Choices are made and changes are implemented, with some seeming small and others being more significant. So here are some of the most striking differences between the new Dune movie and the book, and what I think towards each of them. Starting with a change I did like, there was a big difference in Paul's sister Aaliyah Atreides. In my opinion, the alteration made to Paul's sister effectively maintains the character's strangeness and sense of power from the original novel. In the book, Aaliyah is introduced as a character who possesses advanced communication skills from birth and plays a pivotal role in the climax by eliminating Paul's grandfather, the Baron Vladimir Harkonnen. Villeneuve manages to preserve the eerie essence of Aaliyah's character in his adaptation, as she can still communicate like an adult without being born. And with the film suggesting the future developments surrounding her character too, it gives us a hint that a lot more is to come. Paul has visions of his unborn sister being much older, portrayed by Anya Taylor-Joy, and she reveals family secrets and expresses her affection for him while overlooking vast oceans of water on a future Arrakis. This tells us that Aaliyah is going to be important come June Messiah, and it didn't mean that the character had to be completely removed, just done in a slightly different way to make that work in a modern cinematic telling. This alteration seems to have been driven by various factors, such as the intention to present a more serious portrayal of the character, compared to a silly one we got in a previous adaptation. And by making this change, it becomes easier to convey her strength, maintain her strangeness, and foreshadow her significant role in the future. But the change to Aaliyah also meant that there had to be alterations in different aspects aspects of the film as well. In the book, Aaliyah killed the Baron, whereas in the film, it was Paul who was given that role towards the end. As read in the book, Paul envisions a future where he says hello grandfather to the Baron. So even with it changing things, it was still faithful enough to other ideas of the book, and I must admit, I thought it was satisfying seeing Paul kill him in front of everyone. It also resolves the issue of how to film a three-year-old with adult awareness murdering her grandfather and making that look authentic in this world. Instead, they gave Paul the personal vengeance, and in the context of his revenge and this story, I thought it was delivered on quite well. 
However, Aaliyah being unborn also meant that the conclusion of the story would unfold over a shorter period of time. And by condensing the time skip from two years to about eight months, it meant that Paul and Charney's first child, Leto II, was never born. Now, initially, I didn't like the removal of this because when it came to that character's death, it provided more fuel for that final act of revenge in the battle. However, with baby Leto not having many scenes in the book, the fact that Paul and Charney will have another child named Leto II, and the effective replacement of that tragic moment in the film, I think it was still handled reasonably well. In the movie, their child's death is replaced by the attack on Siege Tabor and the North, and it happens a bit earlier on. In the source material, Baby Leto's death is right before the final battle, whereas the attack in the film takes place before Paul takes the Water of Life. So in a way, they used this attack to give greater purpose towards Paul deciding to take the water. And then when he does take the water and sees that narrow way through, he decides to embark on that path, thus going into battle. In my opinion, the time jump would have messed with the flow of the movie, and with Baby Leto not being there, I think it adds to the idea of Charney's inability to give Paul an heir in Dune Messiah a little extra weight. I am aware that some didn't like this alteration, as they desired a more natural portrayal of the events as depicted in the book. For me though, I thought the time jump was executed quite well and I think changes had to be made to ensure better pacing and a more organic representation of the novel's conclusion. Another change that many have been debating over is the removal of Count Femring. Now, it was kind of odd considering Margot Femring was in the film and many reports stated that Tim Blake Nelson had filmed a scene as the character before he was removed from the final cut. For more reasons than not, I was fine with the removal of Count Femring from part two because, again, to make the film more streamlined and focus on other critical narrative points and characters, it was an understandable decision. Count Femring was a unique character character in Dune being immune to the effects of spice-boosted prescience. However, when it comes to adapting the story into a movie, it makes more sense to focus on Lady Femring and leave out Count, as Villeneuve's vision for Dune emphasises the Bene Gesserit schemes over other aspects of the book. So choosing Lady Femring and going into her character a bit more is a logical decision. Count Femring, while less captivating on paper, is known for defying orders to kill Paul in the final showdown with the Emperor. Having a character known for not killing Paul could have slowed down the climactic ending of part two, and I think that was a big reason for his removal. Despite this though, Count Fenring's awareness of the Bene Gesserit's plans adds an intriguing layer to the Dune universe, even if he himself isn't the most compelling character. In the original book, he stands out as the only one invisible to Paul's prescience, leading some to see him as a failed version of the Kwisatch Haderach. So essentially, he's a failed power player who still holds a lot of knowledge. But by replacing this with more of Lady Femring, her development with Fade, how the Bene Gesserit were manipulating that, and then how Fade is presented as this potential candidate, is enough to focus on in an already packed film. I think the Margot Femring aspect was done really well, so personally, not having Count Femring wasn't a big issue. I would have loved to have seen Tim Blake Nelson in the role on screen, but it's another decision that helped to make the film feel more focused. The next difference between the film and book was one that I think enhanced everything we saw surrounding the Fremen, and that was the depiction of their dispute surrounding the prophecy of the Arrakis Paradise. When we get to Siege Tabor near the beginning of the film, just like in the book, we learn just how precious water is to the Fremen, but also how, for this particular adaptation, Denis has heightened the idea of internal conflict. When Paul and his mother arrive, we learn that the southern Fremen believe that he is the prophesized the Lissan Al-Gaib, while the other more northern Fremen don't believe in that. Stilgar and others believe that the Lisan Al-Gaib could make the dream of Arrakis a reality by transforming the planet with water. When they see the signs and when they see that everything is going as the prophecies predicted, the southern Fremen become more convinced that Paul is their Lisan Al-Gaib. And the Fremen from the north who don't believe see it all as lies and fake prophecies. The idea of the north and southern Fremen wasn't in Frank Herbert's book, and rather, certain Fremen didn't agree with certain aspects of the prophecy and Paul's introduction to them. But by aligning these varying perspectives with different groups of Fremen, I think Villeneuve has done so 
for multiple reasons. One is to make the ending with Charney and the Fremen scenes throughout much more dramatic, and the other is connected to delivering on the central theme of the book, which again is the idea of having scepticism towards charismatic leaders. So it helps to fuel the main message of Dune, and it's a way to make everything much more tense and dramatic on screen. The next changes were the main ones surrounding both Lady Jessica and Charney. In part 2, Jessica takes on a more prominent role while Aaliyah is still in the womb. It is Jessica who takes the lead in advocating for Paul to become the Lisan al Gaib, and her relationship with Aaliyah is portrayed as unsettling, adding another layer in depicting the control of the Bene Gesserit and Jessica's loyalty to the cause. The scene where she talks to Aaliyah about converting the non-believers and saying that they will start with the weaker Fremen was just one moment that shows you how you can add to a character to make them more interesting in a film and then also tease the direction they could be going in. So I pretty much liked all of that. The only thing that I thought was a bit of a shame regarding Jessica was the removal of her tension with Gurney Halleck following Paul's speech, as leading up to that moment in the book, Gurney had believed Jessica was the Atreides traitor, when as we know, it was in fact Dr. Yue. Maintaining this plotline may have played into that aspect of part two, where individual families and factions deal with inner conflict. The Southern and Northern Fremen was just one example, so it may have worked well in expanding upon that thematic. But again, it seems like it was a decision that was made to help the momentum and narrative focus come the end of part two. Overall, when it comes to Lady Jessica, I thought the character was intriguing and everything they did surrounding her and the Bene Gesserit worked in the context of this cinematic adaptation. When it comes to Charney, I know there's a lot of book readers out there who aren't as happy with this, but for me, I thought it was a welcome change that made her character arc much more interesting for part two. I found her character development in the first book to be lacking. While I didn't despise it, and while I do acknowledge her growth and significance to the overall narrative, her portrayal in the movie gives her a stronger sense of independence due to her increased scepticism. I was never completely satisfied with the fact that Paul's love interest was mainly just that, so I appreciate her enhanced role and thematical importance. Her strength, integrity, and determination were admirable, and Zendaya effectively captured those qualities. Chani became a more believable character that Paul could genuinely fall in love with, while also having her own perspectives on Fremen beliefs. Nevertheless, the ending did take a surprising turn, and I can see why some fans had mixed reactions to it. But I do believe that Denny will figure out a way to make her departure from Paul work by the time we reach Messiah. By setting her on this path in part two, he has truly developed her character beyond just being a love interest. I do wish the film had revealed that Liet Kynes was her parent, as it was a significant element in the book and could have added depth to Charney's character development. However, Denny made changes to make her more impactful in part two and effectively convey Frank Herbert's message about questioning charismatic leaders. The ending really drives this message home, and given my appreciation for what was done with Charney, I also enjoyed Villeneuve's general approach to the ending of the film as well. It not only maintained focus on the main narrative, but it also elevated Paul's character thematically. In the novel, Paul marries Princess Irulan for political reasons, while keeping Charney as his concubine. Charney is upset by this, but Jessica tries to comfort her by giving a speech about their roles as true wives. However, in the film, Charney takes a more active stance and rejects Paul's upcoming holy war, despite her love for him. Initially, I had doubts, but now I believe it's fitting as it sets the stage for Messiah and aligns with the movie's tone. It would have felt insincere if we had an overly cheerful ending with Paul and Shani embracing while his army launches their assault. The book left it ambiguous until we got to Dune Messiah, so Denny tried to make that message more obvious to all audiences. Moving on, there were a few other changes that I'm still quite mixed on, and most of these examples include both aspects that I thought were great, but then others that I didn't like as much. One was how some of the details surrounding the Water of Life sequences were captured. Now, there's the obvious change in that the Water of Life scenes were visually less psychedelic than as described in the book. And while I would have liked to have seen more of that weirdness, I still found the scenes to be mostly effective in what they were trying to communicate. The one big difference 
difference, however, that I think could have enhanced Paula and Chani was that there was no spice orgy. I think that scene in the book between Chani and Paul solidifies their love together and sharing their visions and seeing their child in the future is such a beautiful moment. Its removal meant that there was less of the display of prescience that we got in the book. I'm sure that in the next film it will be more of a thing, especially because it's Paul's biggest struggle. But I think having more of Paul's understanding of his visions and moments like that spice orgy might have deepened the effectiveness of those Water of Life scenes. I don't think it was properly shown how much of a change Paul underwent, and I think that they could have spent a bit more time on it. Something that gives us an idea of why the Bene Gesserit are afraid to look where Paul can. Still, I understand that this was a hard thing to pull off, and that Denis aims to streamline the later parts of the film, thus focusing primarily on Paul's change afterwards. Speaking of the more trippier side to Dune, one of the other aspects that was changed from the book was the removal of the Spacing Guild. In the book, the houses are represented by a group known as the Landsrad, although the movie didn't mention them by name. However, one faction that Denis Villeneuve's movies exclude is the Spacing Guild, which has a monopoly on space travel and banking across the galaxy. This is largely due to the Guild Navigators, individuals who have consumed a significant amount of the Spice Melange, granting them limited foresight that aids in navigating through the stars. In the book, we discover that the Fremen use Spice as a bribe to prevent the Spacing Guild from allowing satellites over Arrakis, making it difficult to locate the Fremen's whereabouts. The Fremen exploit this anonymity to initiate the process of terraforming the planet in the southern region. Unfortunately, Dune Part 2 does not incorporate any of these elements. The Spacing Guild are a particular example because they align themselves with Paul and he threatens to destroy the spice fields. The Spacing Guild not only requires space for interstellar navigation, but their very lives depend on it due to their addiction. This is why they bowed down to Paul, and why the Fremen bring the war to the Great Houses. It felt weird that the Guild wasn't there, but there were some positives to take away from this alteration. First off, only Paul has the power to control the threat to spice, as it belongs to his family's atomics. And additionally, the idea of Paul and his family being responsible for the threat to spice and the fate of Dune adds an intriguing twist. So ultimately, while I was anticipating the guild's appearance, I believe their introduction in the beginning of Dune Messiah will be a delightful surprise for viewers, hinting at more of the strangeness in that adaptation. Coming now to the final big change from the book, one that many have again debated over, is the complete removal of Fufi Hawa. This is probably one change that I didn't like as a whole, but I can understand the reasons towards why his character was removed. Fufir, a Mentat serving House Atreides, was portrayed by Stephen McKinley Henderson in Dune Part 1. His fate after the Harkonnen attack remained unknown as he doesn't appear in Part 2, so it's likely that he died much earlier on in this adaptation. But in the book, his journey was much different to what was shown. Forced to work for the Harkonnens after House Atreides' downfall, Fufir's loyalty is ensured through a poison in his blood with the antidote held by the Harkonnens themselves. Despite serving the family for years, he subtly works to undermine them from within by manipulating the Baron and his heir, Fade Rawfer. Fufir witnesses Paul's victory over the Emperor and Baron Harkonnen at the end, and he's thrilled to see that he's still alive. But he's also shocked to discover that Paul is Muad'Dib, the same Fremen leader that he's been aiding the Harkonnens in fighting against for years. The Emperor gives Fufir a poisoned needle, hoping that he will use it to get close to Paul and kill him at the end. But Fufir refuses, exposing his plan to everyone before dying and ultimately redeeming himself. This whole storyline was left out of Dune Part 2, probably because it was just too much to include. And it's a shame because Fufir did have an interesting story. I have one problem with both movies, and that's that Denny completely overlooked the exploration of the Mentas. Piter, who had a lot more depth and purpose in the novel was reduced to a mere henchman. And now with Fufir, they removed the subplot of betrayal so that we couldn't see the former Atreides Menta again. I did enjoy his scenes in the first movie and would have loved to have witnessed his final act of defiance against the Harkonnens. Also, I think they could have used Hawat to give us more of those scenes between him and the Baron, and then when
when it came to the final confrontation, his death may have added more to that central theme of manipulation. But again, while I didn't like the removal of that character, and while many would have liked to have seen him, I understand that they tried to streamline the ending and keep the focus on the integral characters. Plus, I don't think we saw enough of an emotional connection between Hawa and the Atreides in the first film to make this sacrifice truly have that way. I do think it's a missed opportunity with a character as interesting as Hawa, but I understand the reasons for that change. However, the one aspect of Hawat's removal that I did truly like was what I talked about in my biggest questions video surrounding the changes to Fade's gladiator scene. In Herbert's story, Fade and Hawat worked together on a plan to help Fade succeed. But in the movie version, the focus was not on Hawat's involvement or the idea of switching Fade's poisonous blade as it focused on the Baron not poisoning the last gladiator. In my view, this change contributed to making Fade's victory appear more deserved to the audience, and in the following moments, it highlighted the conflict between both the Baron and Fade in a different manner than seen in the book. I believe this alteration was a positive one, and while it meant that there was no sign of Fufi Hawa, it focused on the greater possibility that Fade could be that prophesized figure. I do think we could have had some scenes with Hawa to really give the Baron more to do, and have Fufi be that extra layer of complexity when it comes to the opposing side. But like all the other changes, they made these alterations so that as a cinematic adaptation, the flow and telling of Dune was more approachable for everyone. But that was my video discussing the main differences between Dune Part 2 and Frank Herbert's novel. What do you think of the changes that director Denis Villeneuve made with his adaptation of the second part, and what are some of the other differences that you picked out? Let me know your thoughts down below in the comment section, alongside your overall reaction to the film. For much more videos and news on Denis Villeneuve's Dune Universe, then subscribe to the channel and turn on your notifications. Also, if you enjoyed this video, remember to leave a like rating and follow me on social media via the links in the description. But anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed it. I've been Cortex, and as always, make some noise.